I imagine we've all heard of trickle-down economics, the theory for which if in the short term we help, let's say with tax cuts for example, a few wealthy individuals and corporations at the top, eventually, hopefully, the benefits should trickle down all the way to the bottom, us, the people. What about trickle-down culture? Is there such a structure that has been working in a similar way where few people at the top have had the power or have tasked themselves into selecting a culture that would then trickle down and arrive to us, the audience. Well, it seems that in the past five decades, this pyramid structure was actually there and very busy. When, who, who was then tasked with selecting what was uh, interesting? Talking now about modern and contemporary art. A very small group of people made out of museum directors, journalists, critics, curators, gallerists, and uh, wealthy donors, philanthropists, and collectors. This few wealthy people at the top for the past five decades have selected, decided what was important, what was worth it, what was the value, and what was needed to be catalogued, studied, and included in our museum collections for us to learn, to see, and to identify with. Uh, last year, five art and history of art experts came together with five math and statistic experts. And they did a study uh, that went and looked at what has happened in the modern and contemporary art world when it comes to museums and public institutions in the United States of America. They looked at 18 major US museum collections. Museums such as the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Philadelphia Art Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Dallas Art Museums, and Houston, Los Angeles. Major cities, 18 major public collections in 18 of the biggest and most populated cities in America. They looked at 40,000 works of art in this communal collection, and they found that out of 40,000 works in this collection, 10,000 uh, were the artist represented. They published this uh, study for a nonprofit organization called the Public Library of Science. So, what do you think they found? Out of these 10,000 uh, artists, they found that 85% of them are white. And they also found 87% are actually male. Just to give you a, a quick perspective on these numbers, census data, recent census data about the general US population, tell us that 60.7% is actually white, non-Hispanic. And 50.8% the majority, is actually female. So how this unbalance um, was actually uh, created in the first place? Well, maybe because people at the top making this um, selection um, only were interested in a particular um, type of art or artist and overlooked so many uh, artistic expressions. The study goes on and it gets even more problematic. They found that out of 10,000 of those artists, only 1.2% are actually African American. Now, this doesn't get even much better when we look at just one museum, the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, where historically, 
the city has had a much greater population uh, of African American citizens throughout the, throughout the years. When we get to Atlanta, the, the number only goes up to 10.6%, which is still incredibly low, considering the number of artists included. The National Gallery in Washington, it's even more staggering. And if I may just repeat, the National Gallery in Washington, the capital of the United States, in their collection, 97% of the artists are white, and 90% are male. Now, this is not just a problem of the United States. The Tate Galleries in London, in the United Kingdom, in their latest um, report in 2014, they admitted that, that just 15% of the artists were actually female. So, again, how did this happen? Is it possible, then, that the top, all those people making those decisions, all those people deciding what had to trickle down to us were actually white males. We must all agree that the role of a museum, especially when it comes to modern and contemporary art, is to represent what happens outside of the museum and engage with the artistic community outside of the museum. At the same time, the role of a modern and contemporary museum is to select, catalog, and preserve what is the artistic expression of the society around them for future generations. Future generations that will look at the collection of a museum and try to understand us, trying to understand our society, how we lived, how we communicated, how we created, and how we dealt with the challenges uh, that uh, our time uh, gave us. And artists are usually the best uh, expression of that narrative. What's changing now? A lot is changing. And uh, this is the really good news that I'm bringing to you today, after all these grim statistics. Uh, society has changed. And society has changed in a way that we are much more powerful when it comes to interact with our institutions, with our museums, with our political institutions uh, equally. And society has recognized their power also in influencing, not only to be influenced. And we have also discovered our financial power. You see, today, Galleries, museums, and cultural institutions cannot survive only on government grants and support. Today, museums and galleries around the world, and especially in the United States, uh, have to rely on private money and corporate sponsorship. Now, if you are a corporate sponsor, you need to engage with your consumers. And the consumers are the museum's audience. So if you are a great museum with an incredibly important collection, but no audience, you are a dead institution. You're not going to attract the life of your um, reason to be, which is the audience, and you're not going to attract the support that you need in order to function. So museums in America are quickly having to address this urgent issue, and some very brave one last year led the way. Meet the Baltimore Museum of Art. Last year, the Baltimore Museum of Art announced that they were going to sell seven works by white male from their collection. And among these names were really important and famous artists like Andy Warhol. Now, this obviously generated a lot of controversy and debate on what should a museum do with their holdings? Are they supposed to sell? Are they supposed just to keep them forever? Is, it an or is a collection of a museum an organic representation of who they are? Or is it a static block that cannot be attacked? Well, the Baltimore Museum of Art was brave, and they did sail through the storm, because after the sale, they announced that they raised so much money 
and they were able to create a very large acquisition fund that will last for a number of years to come, which will be focused on acquisitions for uh, artists of color and female artists. Now, the reason for, for them was obvious. They had to stay current and they had to keep representing inside the museum the audience that they had outside the museum. The audience was changing, the population was changing, the society was changing, the museum has to change with them. Or, as I said, it's a dead institution that has no value and no actual cultural importance. Another example. Um, last year, in London, at the Barbican Centre, they put together a first major retrospective of an artist called Lee Krasner. Now, how many of you know who Lee Krasner was without looking at my slides straight away? Uh, pretend it's not there. Uh, Lee Krasner is not very well known. He's not, definitely not a household name when it comes to modern and contemporary art, is it? But if I tell you that Lee uh, uh, Krasner is a very important me member of a group of artists called the Abstract Expressionists, maybe now you start placing her in a, in a different um, light. Who were the ab ab Abstract Impressionists? Some names that are indeed household names. Jackson Pollock, Jasper Jones, Rauschenberg, uh, Clifford Still, who even has his own museum now in Denver. These, were, these are the names that we are all familiar with, with the group of artists, the Abstract Expressionists, that revolutionized art making in America in the 40s and 50s. Now, Abstract Expressionists are the core, the pillar of any self-respected museum in America and in Europe. Abstract Expressionists are the blockbusters of exhibitions. You put together an exhibition of Jackson Pollock, you know that it's going to be sold out. And Abstract Expressionists are also the blue chip of any art collector. So why was Lee Krasner not there? Let's see how The Guardian, one of my favorite newspapers, provocatively um, titled their review uh, of the show at the Barbican. Reframing Lee Krasner, the artist formerly known as Mrs. Pollock. Now, of course, Lee Krasner had two issues. One, being a woman artist, which was never easy. Uh, and second, being married to Jackson Pollock. And Jackson Pollock, who we know is the poster boy of macho action painting artist figure. So she suffered all her career life, and now after her death, still does in some extent, uh, being in the shadow of her husband, which is a very common situation for any woman that lived and worked uh, in the 40s and 50s, let's say not just in America, but around the world. She's finally getting her due. Big museum in, uh, in London is giving her her long-awaited retrospective, and the press is having a field day because diversity in the art world today is big news. And it's also big business. This is the Contemporary African Art Fair, a small uh, group of galleries that mainly represented contemporary African art a few years ago came together and put together a very small art fair, which in the last three years has become one of the most important uh, dates in the calendar of the art world. With three locations, London, New York, Marrakesh, is now one of the most important, sought after, visited, and where most collectors would want to go to discover what is coming out of the African continent. And it's big business also for the major auction houses. Christie's and Sotheby's, the two largest and most important um, uh, auction houses in the world, now they have more and more dedicated auctions, uh, Chinese contemporary art, contemporary art from Africa, from Latin America, from India, 
ab Aboriginal art, Southeast Asia, Middle East. When the market changes, it changes because the audience, and in this case, their customers, demand it. Demands it. So that means that people out there, you, are demanding and driving a change, that it's happening quickly in both parts of the art world, the commercial and the institutional. In the last two years only, we've recorded more records for works of art sold uh, by female artists than ever before. New records have been established for artists like Frida Kahlo, George O'Keeffe, John Mitchell, Yasoi Kusama, and even if the record for the most expensive work of art by a living artist today is still held by white American men, and it's Jeff Koons' Rabbit that sold in May for 91.1 million. His female counterpart is Jenny Savile, that sold last year, a painting by Jenny Savile, that sold last year at Sotheby's for 12.4 million. Now, yes, there is a lot of catching up to do, but trust me, this figure is a very, very promising and important figure that should give a lot of hope for female artists of, of her generation. So, ultimately, what it is that it's driving the art world today? It is indeed diversity, because we, the art professional, need to meet the demand of you, the audience, and the clients, and the collectors. So, approaching a, a, a more informed diversity when talking about what we do, it's the only way to achieve a sense of unity and to be able to produce and present it and re represent better us, the new audience. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.